Steady State Cardio for Boxing. Okay, next question. Your thoughts on steady state cardio, like zone two cardio. I know you've spoke briefly about it before, but just like you to elaborate more on if you think fighters should do it, and if so, what should the training dosage be? So when we're talking about zone two training, this is like said to try and improve aerobic endurance and aerobic capacity. The thing is with zone two training, it's quite understimulating for boxers because we do a test called the lactate profile where we're looking at how an athlete responds to increases in intensity. And what we're actually looking for for their aerobic capacity work is to be under four millimole per liter. Now, because the boxer is really fit aerobically, their lactate threshold actually comes quite late in the test and their heart rate is actually quite elevated. It's actually gone to pass zone two, pass zone three potentially, going up to zone four, going into the orange zone. So the last thing that we want to do is be training in zone two because that is well away from where our aerobic threshold is, our lactate threshold is. We're actually wanting to keep the speed a little bit higher and potentially have the heart rates a little bit higher. So instead of zone two, what we look to do is go to zone three. So instead of the blue zone on your heart rate monitor, we're more looking towards a green zone just under 80% maximum heart rate. With this, we've got that training intensity to optimize aerobic capacity and also able to increase energy expenditure. Now, how often do we actually use this? We only do this either once or twice per week. More often, we only do it once per week. The reason why is because the amount of training that we'd have to do to try and stimulate some adaptation would be weeks and weeks and weeks of work. Whereas like we've only got an athlete in for 12 weeks. So we're wanting to do the training that's gonna have the highest amount of adaptations and also the training that's gonna replicate the demands of the sport. So that's why we do our 30 second sprints, our repeated sprints and our red zone conditioning work because these are the kinds of intensities that our athletes are gonna be expected to do on a repeated basis in their boxing. But also this is what's going to help stimulate higher amounts of physical adaptation in a very short amount of time. Whereas like with the more endurance work, you're only going to see a very small adaptation over a longer period of time. And also it doesn't replicate the demands of the sport. In terms of our aerobic endurance work, zone two, zone three, whatever you want to call it, we only do that for active recovery once or twice per week. We like to put it in the middle of the week to help reduce that training load, that training strain, and also to try and increase some calorie expenditure to help with the weight making process. The only reason why I'd end up doing it twice per week, if an athlete is struggling in terms of their fatigue levels, we might have to swap high intensity session with a recovery session. Also with athletes that potentially might be struggling with their weight class. With zone two, zone three work or aerobic endurance work, beneficial, but it's not the be all and end all. Now, this has actually been shown with recent results that we've had with our athletes. We've seen that they've improved in their aerobic endurance based off the lactate profile without doing much active recovery sessions, much zone two, zone three work at all. We've been predominantly doing sprint training, sprint interval training, and this has helped improve their lactate profile and reduce their heart rates at different speeds. So this is representation of them improving their aerobic capacity. So hopefully that's answered your question. Keeping it very simple, we do aerobic endurance work just once a week, purely back to recovery and maybe to help with athletes losing weight. If you're keen follow boxing science, you will know that we're very data driven, whether that's our sports science research, our strength and conditioning practices or nutritional strategies. We also take this approach into our content creation. That's why we've been developing content that's been engaging, that's helped grow the Boxing Science YouTube channel. And with this analysis and our YouTube engagement, we've actually found out an interesting figure that only 27% of people that watch our videos actually are subscribed to the Boxing Science YouTube channel. That means that a massive 73% of people that watch these videos aren't currently subscribed. We're actually aiming for the Boxing YouTube channel to hit 100,000 subscribers. We want a nice 
silver plaque in this bookshelf here and it will mean the world to us and will also support the growth of the channel to bring you even bigger and better content. So if you're one of them, 73%, if you can ask a quick favor, if you can hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future content and also we'll guarantee better content in the future.